All right, welcome everybody to Crypto Real Vision. I'm your host today, Jeff Kaufman. Uh, we're talking Web3, we're talking marketing, we're talking brand building. Uh, that is the background of myself and, and Matthew here today. I'm the founder of Parachute and Jump. Uh, Jump, which is a community for marketing and advertising professionals um, that care about Web3. And uh, Matthew has a deep background in the world of tech and building brands. Um, and today, uh, since, you know, it's it's good timing because the market is uh, taking a spiral, if you will. Um, but we have a, a, a moment in time to pause and look a little bit deeper uh, at, at our strategies and our long term thinking. And that's what Matthew's known for. So, Matthew, why don't you give us a quick uh, introduction on yourself and what you were up to before Web3? And then we'll we'll talk about some big brain stuff. Cool. Nice to meet everyone. My name is Matt Sweezy. Uh, you can just call me Sweezy. Uh, on Twitter, it's M Sweezy. And fun fact is I thought like, hey, I'll just get the same uh, Twitter handle as my email address, right? M Sweezy. And that was great until a friend of mine was like, hey, man, who's this Miss Wheezy that keeps tweeting at me? So if you need to find me, I am Miss Wheezy on Twitter. Uh, currently, I co-founded the uh, Web3 Studio at Salesforce, where we look at strategy, both internal as well as our customers. Before that, I ran the Futures Lab uh, with a partner. And then been on the evangelist side, really kind of focusing on the future of marketing, owned that POV for the organization for a long time. Uh, notably wrote a book for Harvard Business about the future of marketing and media, kind of like really looking at a lot of the stuff before we really had the terms for it. Um, so yeah, just really excited to be here and yeah, love this topic. Amazing. So I, I would love to sort of go back to some of those early sort of ideas and frameworks that you were thinking about 10 years ago that quite frankly, weren't even possible because Web3 tech didn't exist. And you know, for for a lot of us that have been in in the marketing and brand building space for a long time, uh, Web two took this turn that we weren't quite expecting, um, but we thought different stuff was possible, and it never came to fruition. And then once we saw Web three tech and everything that enabled, all these crazy light bulbs started to go on, going off. So I'd love to start at a high level, take the tech aside. Uh, what are some of these bigger high level strategies that you've been thinking about for uh, the last 10 years? Um, and then we'll move into sort of how Web3 sort of brings that to life. And then from there, we'll really dig into, hey, the game is changing for building brands, um, both on the strategy side, but also the financial equation is just going to look totally different. So Let's talk about those uh, higher level strategies that you've been working on for a long time. Yeah, to me, the two biggest high level strategies are really number one is this notion of individual ownership of data. And um, we've been talking about this under the guise of what we would call VRM. So a buddy of mine named Doc Searles runs the VRM Center over at Harvard. And he's the one who really kind of turned me on to this notion. And VRM stands for Vendor Relationship Management. So the original idea, and Doc wrote a book about this, and I, you know, continued on with this in my book was this notion of what happens when the individual can actually own the data and the the company doesn't own the data and the individual can put out into the world hey world i want x i'm looking at x uh, and then brands can pick up those signals and then work with those individuals so really like the central control of data. now this idea has been worked on for more than a decade uh, the center at harvard has been around for at least a decade but the big problem was, you know, what happens if a company collects all this all this data from individuals uh, and then is the intermediary between that and the brands? Well, then what you end up with is a giant honeypot and you just can't have that. Right. So we end up with this massive data privacy issue. So it's, it was tried for many years. Right. The idea that, you know, individuals should be paid for their data is not new. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's actually what's going to happen. Um, we'll talk about that in terms of value exchange. But that was one big idea. Like what happens when individuals can own their own their data? The second is co-creation. Now, I've talked about co-creation for a long time. And you talked about Web2 took a really radical turn for us. And really, that was kind of social, right? This notion of we no longer really control these things. We have to be a part of conversations, can't control the conversations like we used to, because media is now infinite, right? Anyone can control media. And like, this is one of my favorite things. I wrote a book about it. So I, one of my favorite things, spent four years on this. But it's this notion of like we have to realize like media is so important and web three is a new frontier of media. Like, let's just start with this really quickly. Let me like explain what I'm talking about here. 
So if you're a super media nerd like me, you're, you're really down with this guy named Marshall McLuhan. And like you really understand this notion of media theory where media really dictates how humans behave and like how humans interact and what they think of themselves. Really good example. The notion that we have of romantic love does not come to you natively when you're born. Right. That is a thing that is imprinted into you based on the media that you interact with. Right. Like that's just the thing. Like That's how we know romantic love based on the media we, we see and interact with. And so we start to like take this forward and we start to realize that we are now living in a world that is radically different than anything before. And so before we start talking about brand building and marketing, we have to realize that the media environments dictate the rules for those games to be played. And we had a lot of beliefs that we thought were like marketing truisms, right? Like sex sells. There's no such thing as bad press, like all these ideas. Well, those were ideas that were set in a very specific point in time and that were games only meant to be played in that specific point in time. We unknowingly called them truisms and believed them things to be like universally true. And the reality is, is they're not universally true. They're not true at all, actually. They're just like ideas that we had. They were hypotheses that really couldn't be tested um, because the data wasn't there to actually prove them right or wrong. We've now figured out that those are all wrong. I, I went around about to really get to this one point. This point is, this is the first time in the history of the world that an individual has had the ability to create, distribute, and consume media. Right. Like that is just a foundational, fundamental, radical shift in, in the foundation of humanity. Right. And so once we open that door and that door is really mobile, social, um, last that's 10 kind of, years. Yeah. Last 10 years kind of opened up that door. We had no clue what that future frontier was going to be like, but we knew it was going to be radically different and the rules would be reset. And so, you know, I'm super excited about VRM, super excited about individual ownership of data, super excited about co-creation. And then this Web3 thing comes out and it's like all of those dreams that we had that we couldn't figure out ways to do in Web2 now have ways to do them in Web3. So when we talk about co-creation, right, we know about user-generated content. And every time I talk about co-creation, people are like, yeah, we use our customers' images. I was like, no, like that's like the babyest of baby steps. I'm talking like co-create your product. Like have your community do your marketing, have your community run your support, like a whole nother level. And that, that's what DAOs are, right? And so like mm -hmm. we now have a structure and a format and a process and, and validating points of like how these things can make billion dollar business units and lines among themselves. We talk about like individual ownership of data and now we have the blockchain and now we have the ability for personal wallets and we have a mechanism in people's hands that allow these things to actually happen. So like, I'm just going to stop there, but, but I'm super excited. But to me, those are the two big ideas that I was so excited about that Web3 makes real. Yeah, totally. And, you know, when we talk about how that applies to some of the fundamentals of marketing, brand building, and when we think of like the largest brands in the world, and will they be around in 10 years? Because one of the things that happened in the between 1990 and 2020 is that half the Fortune 1000 just turned over. And now we're coming up on another 20 to 30 years where half the Fortune 1000 is going to turn over. But you mentioned something called a DAO, uh, which I almost consider this whole new category of like enterprising biz businesses and brands, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got a whole new category of brands that are native to Web3 and native to this economy who are, do who are executing this idea of co-creation. And so you've got the legacy brands that have to now evolve, adapt, and change, and then compete against all of these upstarts that are going to be complete, that are completely sort of native to this culture and this uh, philosophy. And one of the areas that you've spent a lot of time working on is sort of the, the metaverse and the meta native, right? The meta native individual. And so these, the, the, the next generation of consumers, right? Millennials are sort of in their prime. We're at peak spending. Brands want to talk to millennials. And then right on the heels, we've got Gen Z, the meta native consumer. And if we're thinking about, again, put the craziness of the market aside, if we're truly thinking about our 10 year strategy, we've got to really think about this entirely new consumer. So mm -hmm. I'd love to sort of dig into, you know, that area who who is this new consumer who is the meta native consumer and and what does that mean for startups and 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 brands yeah so the first thing i want to do is too often we forget the term marketing 
and what it actually means. And too often we put it into a, a tactical representation. It really just means relationship to a market. Like how do we relate to a market? Like we have to start with that. And when we start with that, then the next step is to say, well, the market is radically different. Like what, how the market fundamentally acts is very different, right? In the old market, it was a command and control. We brand, dictate what market is, we control the communication, we control what happens. Social and the web for the last 10 years really started to, to morph that into something very different where there was participation in the market from social. And now we're in a whole new world, to your point, like DAOs, there's a whole new world. So just like, I always want us to keep that in mind. But then when we think about that, relationship to the market is how do individuals behave and what do they want to behave and how do they want to participate in the market? And then that is radically shifting. And, and the biggest things to me about the radical shift, we talk about the meta native, first off, I'll just define meta native. So, you know, if I'm talking to a CMO right now and trying to be like, hey, you need to really understand Web3 and why it's important. It's, there's one really simple line and I say it every time. And like when I do, if a light bulb hasn't gone off, it fucking blows up and here's it is. It says, what did you do to reach millennials? That's it. I ask a question. What did you do to reach millennials? And the answer is we went social, right? We have direct to consumer commerce, right? DTC. We have social media marketing. We invested in influencer marketing. Um, I mean, like it, just go down the list of what you do to reach millennials. It was also because they were a socially native generation. We had to become socially native businesses to meet them where they were. But then if we look at, and I love this question, right? If you have kids, just ask the question, what did your kids ask for for Christmas? To me, this is one of the biggest telling behaviors of future demographic change. What do kids ask for for Christmas? Well, what did they ask for for this Christmas? Robux. Robux dollars, right? We have to realize there's an entire generation that has digital currency already in their wallet. They exchange digital currency on a daily basis. They use that digital currency to buy digital goods. It's not even an, it's not really a new idea for them. It just is. It's how they operate. They have more virtual clothes than they have physical clothes in some cases. They care more about their virtual presence and their physical presence. Half of the people engage in the metaverse, not to play, build or play, but just to experience life and hang out. No different than you and I did on AIM, right? Like it's no different. It's just cooler, right? <laughs> like you still have a handle, like you're still going there after school. Like that's where they're going. And like, so to me, like, that's a really important part, right? So let's just break down a couple of these aspects of, of the meta data. First off is that they are the media, right? They live in an immersive virtual world. And to them, it's an omniverse, right? To them, they expect the exact same things wherever they go. And they're going to have different social handles for the different expectations that they want. They already do that. The second is vocation, right? So what is the vocation of a meta native, right? So if we start to look at this and kind of compare, so millennials really kind of get into this gig economy world. Gen Z's really kind of start to pick up and this kind of blends into the social influencer world, right? And my favorite stat is if we ask kids what you want to be, you know, the number one thing that they want to be are video influencers, YouTube influencers. I used to call like, it Gen Like I. us right now. <laughs> yeah. We're so, we're so influencer. Uh, yeah, you can watch my Twitch stream of me making PowerPoint presentations later if you want. It's super rad. Uh, every day. Oh my God, that'd be hilarious. Enterprise Twitch. Um, and so, yeah, so then you get like this next idea of, yeah, so vocation, right? Social influencers, and that's what the kids want to be. Well, now if we look at where kids really spend their time, it's on whole new social platforms, right? You have 300 million people every day inside of a metaverse and how i'm classifying that number is just minecraft roblox and fortnite that is not sandbox to central land or any others and the most interesting thing is what they do in these worlds and this is a radical transformation of how they will expect things in the future because if you go into roblox you're not playing a game that a brand made not yet you're playing a game that you, well, someone else made another individual made you're co-creating mm -hmm. these worlds together and you're co-building and you're co-interacting that is a radical shift in how they think about work right so different than just basically being an influencer it's their co-building worlds it's an evolution past and then if we talk about like you know money well this is an easy one we already talked about crypto we talked about virtual wallets and then the next is identity. And they use NFTs, they use avatars, they use PFPs. This is their identity. And so when you start to look at who is this meta native con consumer and what will their purchasing power be? So the guesstimate is that purchasing power in 20, 2035 for this meta native generation is going to be $20 trillion. 
that will almost be on par equal to boomers and Gen X at that time, right? So it's mm. not too far away that they're going to be one of the most significant buying powers in the world. Um, their demographic size-wise is bigger than any other demographic. Their purchasing power on par when they're just young is going to be greater than the two oldest demographics. Um, and they are our future. So like we have to understand who they are and how to meet them. And that kind of takes t sort of changes or, or ties back to something you said earlier about media and where we spend our time as individuals, which then is as consumers uh, and which then in turn affects where brands and mm -hmm. businesses want to spend their time. But then the medium dictates what that interaction looks like. And so instead of delivering a social post with cool carousel flippy like things right now it's co-creation in a game is, is is kind of what you're describing in a sense yeah all of the above it's all going to be yeah. there right but they all have to interact um but the, the main difference is just how the individual expects to interact and they expect to be a part of the show they don't expect to be uh an audience member they expect to like co-create these worlds they, they want some type of ownership inside of these things um that's one of the major changes for me in terms of the meta native. Which to be quite honest, I mean, I love where this is going because you know, when we kind of look at where social ended up, the one of the phrases that always comes to mind for me is doom scrolling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the, our feeds basically turned into just like scroll, 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 scroll. We used to co-create on social, right? Yeah. Like that was actually a thing. We co-created Instagram with Instagram. We did. And then some brands came in and co-created a little bit. And then there was this weird shift to where like, you know, in a lot of ways it just turned into consumption and just turned into consumption. And so if we look at this just general idea of co-creation, a couple of brands got it really, really, good, really right. Instagram, Pinterest, right? We don't think of mm -hmm. them as traditional brands in the sense of like a Coca-Cola, but they're very much a brand in, a, in and of themselves. And they very much got the idea of, of co-creation, right? But sort of a couple of things you're, you're touching on is that co-creation will become the norm across um, not just a select few, but virtually a standard in which like a baseline. And I want to dig in just a little bit here because th there is some mathematics right so like if we use the analogy of this notion of advocacy and influencers right mm -hmm. like no more than 10 percent of your audience will ever be vocal advocates for brand that's just how humans mm -hmm. operate and we're yep. talking about co-creation I, I can't expect more than 10 percent if they won't talk about you to then want to co-build with you so i think it'll be a smaller subset in like terms of hardcore actually doing the work but this notion of co-ownership of the brand and an elevation from consumer to co-owner doesn't necessarily mean that the individual has to do hardcore work, but they feel some type of vested interest inside of this relationship past just the intrinsic notion of like, I feel cooler because I've got Nike on my shirt and my tribe likes Nike, right? Like past that. And so like, I think that is gonna be the next big thing. It's not just like, are we co-building these things? It's really the shift in terms of, how we feel relations or how we feel that we relate to the brand. And it's not just, I'm a consumer. It's, you know, if I buy an NFT and then NFT goes up in value, that allows me to, to take some type of co-ownership of that brand with me. And I don't have to build anything. I just have a different relationship because the mechanics are different. And I think that's the big key here is like, yes, some part of the demographic want to co-build, not a massive part, but then a massive part will want to shift in how they have the relationship with the brand. They will want a very different relationship moving forward because that's how they're being trained right now. So that co-ownership co is NFTs. That's kind of the component that allow us to get there, which is a completely new relationship with with customers or community. Or, yeah, and I think or, just token in general, right? Like I think there'll be like just token. Yep. Yeah. And so when we think about, I want to, I want to imagine a, a, a world. And so we've got brands starting to launch their first sets of, of NFTs, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got brands starting to purchase NFTs. Mm -hmm. And when we start to think about big brands, like, 
Web3, metaverse, NFTs. What are some of the what are some of the high level things you're thinking about in terms of like crawl walk run in in bringing brands into this space? Yeah, so this is a fun one. So you've got definitely your pioneers, right? We're in pioneer phase, right? Time's a pioneer. Um, Adidas, pioneer. Um, you know, like so we've got some big pioneers. We've got a lot of people who were testers, right? Charmin did a horrible test. Pepsi did some tests. Budweiser did some tests. Um, I wouldn't call a lot of those anything past tests. And you really can't like discount the fact that they were tests. Now, have they been follow on from some of those brands? No. Were they good tests? Mm, they were tests. Um, but like crawl, walk, run, like right now, crawl for most, I'd say like 98% of brands, you just need to do some basic, like understanding, set up a Slack channel internally, find out who your, your web three DGENs are. You got, you got them. You just don't know who they are. Set up a Slack channel, let them start these conversations out, guide you, right? Like that's the biggest thing, because if you don't bring your own internal community with you, I have a hard time imagining you're going to bring the rest of your community with you in a, well, in a good way, right? So just start internally. So set those conversations up. Um, start looking and, and listening of what's happening, right? Talk to your consumers about like, hey, if we imagine a different future, what would you what would you want from us in that future, right? If we gave you more control of us and we gave you a different type of relationship, what might would you want with that, right? And start experimenting and testing. I'd say those are some good crawl methods, some walk methods, like have conversations about how do you accept crypto, right? That's probably the number one conversation you need to have today is if you're not talking with your CFO and you don't have a plan in place and you're not asking the lawyers, how do we deal with this? Then you're totally going to be behind the eight ball, right? The big questions you got to figure out. Do you keep it on your books? How do you get it? How do you allow someone to transact with crypto? How do you deal with tax in this world? Like, do you care? Like, these are all questions you got to be talking about now, right? And honestly, you need to make sure that you have legal support for this. I promise you, your lawyers that you have can't support you on this. You're going to need to find some Web3 crypto native lawyers that are going to help you with these things. Um, and then the other is like, those are where you, you just start today. And then if you want to run. You go, you go talk to Miss, Mr. Sweezy. <laughs> yeah, Miss Sweezy's here for you. Um, but I mean, like running, like there's lots of different things we can do to run, right? And I do want to caution brands with this really quickly, right? Running doesn't mean you have to launch a project. Running can simply mean that you extend the utility of other projects. And that's like a big thing I've been working on right now is what I call over the top utility, which is, you know, as a brand, it would behoove you more to go find projects of your, your target audience and work with those projects and find ways to incorporate those things into your world and extend the value of those projects rather than necessarily just launching your own project. In the future, everyone will do both, right? But just realize you don't have to actually launch a project. You can just extend the value of an existing project and save yourself a lot of time, resource, and still have a lot of bang for the buck. I love that because when when... The easy thing to do is to get caught up in the in the hype of the moment and be like, oh, we got to go launch an NFT, right? And it mm -hmm. almost feels like the days of when the iPhone came out, and the, the apps were hitting the store. It was like every brand has got to have an app. And it's like, hold on a second. Most brands didn't end up with a solid app, uh, but they ended up with an app strategy. Right? right. And they ended up with really important mobile strategies, but they didn't necessarily need to go out and build. And so those lessons there of one, start a conversation internally and then with your closest customers mm -hmm. to accept crypto, like just start allowing your customers to purchase with it, even if it's small amounts. Um, and then the extending the utility, there's a couple things there. Um, most often times, if you're going to extend the utility of another project, you're probably going to buy those NFTs as a brand and just doing that, just the act of purchasing an NFT, you've got to get your security set up. You've got to get your compliance set up. You've got to do all of this like internal sort of heavy list lifting. And in a lot of ways, if we look at individuals, like what person went out and launched an NFT before they actually like had a conversation, bought another NFT, learned a lot about the space. And then those individuals in it, like it's a pretty, all the failed projects. Those are just yeah, all, all the failed, failed projects. projects launched NFTs before they actually bought NFTs. Exactly. Um, so, so those are some, those are some great lessons. Um, let's, do, let, where, do, where should we go from here? What's, what are some of the big things on your mind about the future 
what you're thinking about. This this is easy. This is an easy one. I mean, this is like all we do all day. It's just, it's called utility. Like that's, I mean, that's it. It's like, we have to, the, the two biggest things on my plate are number one business case, and then is wrapped in utility, right? How do we essentially work with brands to prove out that there's a, a business case? I'm not having to prove out to you guys, right? I'm not trying to prove out to this audience. I've got to prove out to executives. I've got to prove out to the rest of the world of why this is a good thing for business and how this makes dollars and cents, right? Like that's what we're, we're at. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we create enough utility for these projects that there is significant value to the individual. Number one, part of that utility has to be user experience. And we're in a shit state with user experience, right? Like it has to just... Like just the basics. We all know this. Everyone on this call knows this, right? Like Jeff, let's say that you send me a text. You're like, dude, you got to get on this project. How long is it going to take me to move money around to get into that project? Sometimes it's like silly how hard it is to do these things. And so we've got to work as an industry to get like UX to a good place, right? We've got to figure that out. Then we've got to make sure that the brands that launch projects have significant utility and then there's good use case and value for it, right? Because just bad stories hurt us all. Right. Like if there's one more story about like, you know, I, I, we've got a whole channel internally about people who hate this stuff. And like I yep. get slacks every day from like just the Internet trolls of like, here's like Web3 is going great. And like, here's like, you know, this proves that crypto is a horrible idea. That's not a horrible idea. You just can't see the future. Um, it's not your fault. And so like that, that's where I think we're going to work on it. It's like that's the thing I'm most I'm biggest and, and most focused on. And that's why I love this notion of over the top utility. Because I think that the couple of things we got to do is to chicken or the egg. We don't have enough people with wallets in their hands currently. We need more wallets in hands. The only way we get more wallets in hands is if we have a way and a reason for them to have a wallet. Crypto is a great reason for a lot of people, but it's not the big reason for many people, right? So for the next evolution of the marketplace, we've got to figure out what is that next killer utility? And then how do we get that to people? And then how do we work together to extend those utilities? Because as we add value to each other, then that adds value to existing things, hence makes those things that they have more valuable and then extends them. And we just don't become an app that just never gets used. And so speaking of UX, speaking of utility, Instagram just launched (laughs) NFT integrations. Yeah. Last week, literally, yeah. the, the they announced it, and then the first couple NFT posts were were put on Instagram last last week. I believe the integration was with Polygon and uh, Ethereum with Flow and Solana to follow. So when we think about okay, Instagram, what's the stats? Two billion, a billion, a billion, two billion users. Uh, yeah, five hundred like, million daily active. Yeah, five hundred million daily actives. Okay. So, and so in the not too distant future, we could see hundreds of millions of people with a wallet that might be powered by Instagram. Dude, if they make a custodial wallet, which I don't, I didn't dive too deep in. I, I'm no offense, dude. I'm like so deep in it's something I can't even like look at news at the moment. If they make a yeah. custodial wallet and they tokenize feeds, that would be a killer utility. Right. Like that would essentially like that would be phenomenally and massive. Right. If Elon buys Twitter, I imagine he's going to do the exact same thing. Right. This is like the future monetization of social media, just essentially tokenizing your feeds. Right. Yep. It, that's a micro community. Right. Let, let's just take one step back. I talked about time as a pioneer. Why did Keith do this? By the way, Keith's CEO of Time. Why did Keith do this? Because he believes in micro communities. That is what set him down this path was this notion that he believes the future of media and news are micro communities. And I agree. Like, look at what all we talk about, right? Podcast, micro communities, right? Like, so then you tokenize those communities. And that's a really simple next step, right? So I think like, yes, those are definitely in the path to mass adoption. And those like create real utility. Like people can see the utility in those things really easily and clearly. So when, when I first got into the space and I started really going down the path of, of Web3, probably about two years ago, and, and when it kind of started to, to enter the world of like a marketer and a brand builder and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, my first, I, I thought Facebook and Instagram were dead in the water. And then now I've started, I've, I, I've, I've taken that back and I'm looking at what's happening in discord with tokenized communities. And now I look at this integration and fa- and Instagram didn't say, no, use our NFT platform. Instagram said, nope, we're going to integrate with all of these blockchains. 
And then you said tokenized feeds are what you are, are you describing a world in which influencers and brands can start to share can token gate content and kind of these these new micro communities can basically form based off of the NFTs that you hold. Um, and it kind of brings kind of brings back some of that that smaller, closer knit groups that we kind of had in the early days of social before these platforms just became just algorithmically charged feeds that almost lost kind of lost a connection with with us. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's, it's not it's not a hard concept, right? Patreon has been doing it. Only fans does it, right? Like it's it's an easy concept to understand. We're just going to add it to the media world, right? And that is going to be a good thing for creators. And then and then so and then Coinbase they launched their NFT sort of marketplace, and they it very much looked like a social experience. It looked like a social profile. Yeah, you can like see the feeds. You can see what people are buying. I'm not. It has not gone well. We'll, yeah. we'll say that the the experiment has not gone well. Yeah, I think it's just because it's the market. But do we see do we see Instagram or Facebook becoming a primary marketplace for NFTs? Could Instagram acquire OpenSea? Is there too much regulatory concern there with customer data, or is it just like wow, any of this stuff can happen? Uh, but we do think that. Uh, you know, Instagram and, and Facebook with these integrations and, and a wallet coming right after that is basically we're taking this niche thing and we're about to experiment with us with it with probably hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in the next two to three years. And actually, Instagram and Facebook are going to be the ones that bring NFTs and, and wallets to the masses. Yeah. And I think the simple answer is yes, as long as they execute well. Um, and I think that gives us a whole new place to play, right? Like, because once you start having that, brands can essentially help out here. Like, this is a place where we can take part, right? Whether that is helping people get into communities, whether that is, you know, I, I'll keep going back to this notion of over the top, right? Like, so you have the subscriptions of these five things. Like you have these five different things. Well, when you connect to my site and you want to check out, just simply connect back to a data play. Connect your wallet. Let me see what's in the wallet. And I'll do a real time discount and coupon based on who you are, right? This is a whole new way that we identify persona of an individual, right? It's permissioned. Right. It's in real time. Uh, it's directly actionable. Um, and so like, you know, these are places that brands can start to play as well um, from just a different side. But yeah, simpler is a yes. And then so back and then tying it back to sort of one of the, the points you made earlier, which is about the individual owning their data. And right now, Facebook and Instagram meta uh, largely known for basically being a big honeypot of data, owning our data, monetizing our data. And the, you know, the truth is we all work for Facebook and Instagram and Twitter because we do stuff for free and then they monetize that via ads. Um, could we see that start to shift with, you know, if it's, if, if, if you have a wallet, do you lock and we log into Instagram and Facebook with our wallets and we have our NFTs and we own our data, right? Like, well, well, it's, where that's, does that head? That's the trick, right? So let's just like, just talk about this really quickly. We don't own that. They own that. It's first party data that they glean, right? So anything that we do on their platform, they're taking that. And we're happy to make that exchange because they've created this social platform that we're addicted to, right? So there's a solid value exchange for that. Now, and they're still going to sell that data, right? They're still going to sell that off. The difference is how will it be actioned upon, I think, in the future. Um, but there's no way that they're going back on that revenue model. It made them for trillionaires, right? Like they're, they're not going back on that model. They're just going to continue and find new ways to create revenue. Um, and then as the third party cookie goes away, a lot of their core revenue won't be, they'll have to augment and this will be an augmentation of that revenue. I imagine they'll create an NFT platform. They'll take cuts on that. That'll be a marketplace. Like that'll be a revenue stream, um, new aspects of data. But in terms of like, will they change? No. It seems like brands are going to have to really, and you talked about making the business case. Um, it seems like brands are going to have to become sell digital goods, 
Like if it's just like we we we've we've gone so far in the physical goods that that we can uh, sell. You talked about earlier that the future generations are already owning more phys- digital clothing than they are yeah. uh, physical clothes. Um, and if those generations grow up and have remote jobs, that could continue to change. I've got more avatars than I do nice suits. Uh, I mean that's that's already the case. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, it seems like the uh, as an entrepreneur or as a brand, you have to sort of take a step back and say, you know, my revenue and my business is going to have to largely shift to digital goods. Is that fair? I don't. It's fair for some. It's not generalization for all, right? So, like, mm-hmm. I have to look at the world through like all the different lenses. For mega enterprise, the answer is most people yes right so if you're an smb i don't know if that's true um i think everyone will embrace an aspect of web3 period yes um and that's just the simplistics of connect a wallet allow someone to pay with crypto everyone has to do that period that is an unquestioned across the globe everyone um the next question of like you know do you have to make digital goods i don't know if that's true for everyone right so like you can simply like i said earlier you can just acknowledge that someone has a digital good and create value for them with it, right? That mm. doesn't mean you create a digital good yourself, rather you extend the, the level of someone else's digital good. So I think there'll be some that make them. I think there'll be others that recognize them and extend the value. Um, but I think everyone has to play. I'm just not sold that everyone has to sell a digital good yet. Got it, got it. Where does paid media go? Right. And what, where, where, what stage are we in with Web3? Because the Web3 ecosystem, it's kind of funny. We've got this whole world of Web3 that's, but the, but all of the marketing, all the media, all the comms are Web2 based or even further back in traditional. We're seeing lots of sports sponsorships and yeah. TV commercials during the Super Bowl. <laughs> Crypto and stadium. Uh, Crypto stadium. But we, we are truly, we're so early when we talk about paid media that's native to Web3. And this might be, you know, we might need a whole nother hour to talk about this, or we might need some coffee to kind of get going. But, and on the frontier, you know, we've got wallet to wallet chat coming. Like that's going to come here yeah. pretty darn soon. Mm-hmm. Um, and once we can have conversations in those wallets, you know, it's got to, it's not rocket science, but it's got to, you, you can imagine paid conversations or paid opportunities, but Let's push on that real quickly. Here's a question. Now, this is theoretical. Do we imagine what's going to come first, right? Wallet to wallet communication is definitely going to happen, right? Airdrops, like kind of the precursor to what we can understand. Might we just imagine like token gated email access? Like yeah. I like create my own NFT and I give you NFT or I give you access and then I control that like to my email, like might we just imagine some world where it's instead like we still use email, but it's gated in some way, shape or form. That way I can mm. still remove access. Maybe it's like, you don't get my email address. I just give you a key, can keep up with those keys, but the email is still the inbox that I use. I don't know. I'm just saying like, I, I, I'm much, I much more believe that we will find ways to use things that we've already invested significantly within to embrace them in this new way, rather than totally recreating new net new new. Right. There's just too much change at once. Um, I think we'll see steps. And so I think like we'll take existing things, embrace methods of Web3 until we get enough time, until we create net new, net new. Right. We had email for probably 30 or 40 years before we had social media. Right. So I just mm-hmm. think it's like it'll take us a while to get to like true wallet communication because that's just going to be hard. Right. Yeah. It'll be yep. like you know, too, too small of a market for it to be mass adopted yet. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got to have that, that sort of the, the layer two solutions. And that's where it does, you know, not to take it back to, to Meta and Instagram and, and whatnot with them introducing wallets and what kind of wallet to wallet communication they can naturally sort of bring into the equation. Uh, but man, this has been awesome. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, what, where can people find you? What are you working on? Yeah. Um, and let's close, let's close with that. So you can find me on Twitter. That's the easiest place. Um, also on LinkedIn. So just Matthew with one T and then Sweezy. It's I'm literally the only guy in the world with this name. Um, it's pretty funny. And then, uh, 
Yeah, so what am I working on? So I co-founded the Web3 Studio at Salesforce. So I really work um, at the intersection of like big brand and strategy around this topic. So helping guide us, kind of how we think about this, what are we going to build? What are we thinking about doing? Um, working with our biggest customers, helping like be the bridge and get them into there. Um, there's a lot of really cool shit I'm doing behind the scenes that I just can't say on this call yet. Like give me another month and you'll read some announcements. Um, but so like, yeah, there's just a lot of cool things. I, what I'm personally just fascinated and focused on, like I said, it's just utility. Um, just how do we essentially extend it and how do we make this thing work and real, right? Like, so. Yeah, yeah. Get it down, get it down to practical uh, brass tacks, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, what I love about just you uh, sharing this with us today and the place that you sit in the world of enterprise brands, enterprise MarTech, um, is that two years ago, this wasn't really a conversation, right? This, like, really? We weren't having these conversations two years ago. And so we fast forward, maybe even 18 months ago, we fast forward to today, and we have an individual like yourself heading up some big work at, at Salesforce, having big conversations with enterprise brands, and the shift that that's going to have on the economy. Because we're talking trillions of dollars um, in marketing spend, advertising spend, brand building spend across the Fortune 1000. And we're talking about this massive shift in attention across generations in utility. And now we have the largest sort of media channels, as you said, it, that sort of paves the way. We have the largest social media channels ad adopting this and who knows what happens with Elon. And so 18 months ago, not having any of this conversation, fast forward, here we are, the biggest brands in the world are talking about this starting to build their shop. Yeah. And, and with that, Jeff, the conversations, even in those brands are changing, right? Like 12 months ago, we're having very different conversations now than we had 12 months ago, right? Internal mm -hmm. organizations have, they have like, of course, these are all like made up titles, but we've got like, you know, metaverse officers, we've got like web three leads at companies. Well, now, whether that's just like social, or that's the youngest kid in the room, or the person like the biggest DJ in the company, like, it's really how they're starting. Um, but the conversations have moved past, like, let's just test NFT to let's get serious about this. Let's really investigate and spend time figuring out what this means. I've seen some of the most creative ideas come out recently that I'm so excited about that are really good. Right. And that really are not just like it's a piece of art. It's, it's just like it gets past the right click save argument. Um, and mm -hmm. so I'm like really excited to, like, to see what the brands come out with. And you're right. Like we're talking like these are the biggest brands in the world with the biggest platforms, the biggest stage and the biggest budgets. And I think you're also right is the budgets. Right. This is a significant shift. Right. Budgets are going to have to pay for this. And so where that money is going to come from, people are pulling budget away from other places and putting it into these tests. Um, and I fully imagine if these tasks are successful, that, that those will stick. And these, these shifts of flow from dollars, from paid media and other channels will move into Web3 because they can prove a significantly different type of return. Those massive budgets, people outside of the marketing and, and, and media world don't realize how big these budgets are. We're talking trillions people. of dollars. Yeah, we're talking trillions. We're saying entire the two, large, two of the largest internet brands in the world, right, uh, or, or internet started Google. Facebook built off the back of brand advertising and brand marketing budgets, right? These dollars that are coming out of these Fortune 1000 com uh, uh, companies are, they shift economies, right? Just the marketing mm -hmm. budgets alone. Yep. And then on top of that, we all know uh, crypto can be a little bit scary, a little bit questionable, right? But we have brands with incredible history, with incredible trust, and when they bring things to the market and to their customer bases, it lends that credibility that kind of crypto has been lacking for a long time. Exactly right. Exactly right. These are, this is the biggest difference. And I want everyone, everyone on this call, I think gets it, but I just want to make this point anyways. These are web two brands moving into web three. What we've seen up to this point are web three brands in web three, right? Those are all the big projects. This is the next evolution of how do we get the next market in? And when I'm talking with, when I talk with brands, like yep. you get some brands who are just in it for the hype and they, they just want NFT and they just want drop my thing on ETH. Cause that's where the NFT market's at. And like those brands, they ain't going to make it. The brands that really say, hey, listen, 
let's find a way to connect. And then they're finding out ways that like, how does my existing customer base benefit? How do I sell this to my existing customer base? Those are the ones to watch because those mm -hmm. are the ones bringing new people into the market and exactly yeah. right. They're doing it through a trusted brand that they already know. And in this world, I just call this web two plus, right? Cause mm. none of those existing brands give up everything they've ever done before. They just add right. one more thing to the chain, right? And so they're mm -hmm. just adding more to what they've already done. And it's just a new marketplace. These are just new products, just new markets. So it's just web two plus for these brands and exactly right. To me, that's the next evolution. And like, that's what I'm really excited about is watching those brands and then seeing the net new people, right? These are net new wallets, right? These are net new people who've never owned these things before. And they're experiencing it through a way that makes sense to them. They're not experiencing it through, you know, DeFi. They're not experiencing it through like the NFT game. They're mm -hmm. not traders. They're just getting better shit out of life that they want. And then mm -hmm. that's like, to me, like what has to happen next and what I'm really excited about. Well, even, even though we're in a, I hate to call it a, a bear market, there's a lot to look forward to with uh, sort of basically what you said, the net new uh, Web3 participants that are coming in through social Web2 Plus and all the big brands uh, that have those established relationships and are looking for the next competitive edge. So if I were to uh, keep a pulse on Web3, we've had several transitions, several sort of bigger moments um, and, and, and sort of over the last 12 years, I really do think the place to keep an eye on for the next 12 to 18 months, as far as where there's going to be a lot of activity and a lot of growth, and a lot of what's going to shape crypto and Web3 is social platforms, Web2 social platforms, mm -hmm. and then the big brand world, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of, as you said, how do we expand the Web3 market? This is where, this is where the conversation is going to be happening. Uh, so this has been fantastic. We'll have to do it again in 12 to 18 months to see how right or wrong we were. Uh, but this is going to Just laugh at me and be like, oh, you were so wrong, Sweezy. <laughs> awesome, man. This has been great. Have a good one. And uh, we're signing off. Take care, everybody. Later. Hey, visionaries. Thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to Real Vision dot com forward slash crypto you'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise get in-depth analysis and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights